This is Andy Johnson with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I'm on St. Matthew Island, Alaska, by some measures the most remote wilderness in the country. It's an uninhabited outpost of jagged pinnacles, talus slopes, and tundra valleys that give way to sheer cliffs. Scientists are documenting rapid changes across the Arctic. And for the first time in six years, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service sent a team here for a month to collect long-term data on changes to the island's bird life. Stephanie Walden and Bryce Robinson are working for the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. And Rachel Richardson is from the U.S. Geological Survey's Alaska Science Center. They're here to study and resurvey populations of the Pribilof rock sandpiper and the McKay's bunting. My colleague from the Cornell Lab, Irby Lovett, and I are here to film the birds and record their songs. This is the only place on Earth where McKay's buntings nest. The Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge is a collection of protected lands spread across coastal Alaska. Together, the refuge provides habitat to around 80% of Alaska's nesting seabirds. St. Matthew Island sits isolated, more than 200 miles from the mainland. It stretches 30 miles long and just a few miles across, and it's one of the first areas to be protected by the National Wildlife Refuge system. For the seabirds arriving here, St. Matthew is critical. The coastal talus and cliffs offer safe nesting sites. Colonies are supported by cold, nutrient-rich waters full of plankton and small fish. It's perfect habitat to breed and raise young. One of these colonies is just a mile north of our camp, at the base of the Glory of Russia Cape. We've set up a blind, where soft sediments collapse into a precarious slope of loose boulders. And at dusk, we're surrounded by laughing, croaking calls. Tens of thousands of leased and crested auklets stream in from the open water to gather outside the deep crevices. It's still early for nesting, but their spectacular courtship is already on display. Both males and females sport a loose crest of feathers on their foreheads, and it's amazing to watch them clamoring together, flaunting their plumes for potential mates. Working here is exhilarating and exhausting. Since researchers only visit every five to seven years, we're collecting as much data and footage as we can. And with 20 hours of daylight, we're caught in a tireless delirium. Every moment is valuable, and we're constantly on the lookout for McKay's buntings and rock sandpipers. We find the sandpipers in wide tundra valleys, foraging for insects out in the open. But their mates are a little tougher to see. They sit frozen and perfectly camouflaged in the lichens and mosses, brooding their chicks. Less than 100 yards away, long-tailed Jaegers are also nesting and patrolling the tundra. They'll eat sandpiper eggs and young. So to find cover, these exposed chicks need to move quickly, just hours after hatching. They're better hidden in nearby sedge meadows.
hiking higher onto the island's foggy slopes, we find our other target, the McKay's Buntings. They're most abundant here, in fields of volcanic talus, darting through the rocks in pairs. The buntings are nicknamed snowflakes, and I can see why. It's hard to predict, but males perform this beautiful arcing display flight, floating down to advertise a choice crevice. And if they're lucky, an interested female will inspect the site's potential for building a nest. In our four weeks here, we find nests across the island, watching flecks of white disappear into the dark rocks. We're noticing the chicks stay hidden in the nest for nearly two weeks after hatching, much longer than expected for a small songbird. It seems like the buntings are taking full advantage of the safety in these deep crevices. Once the chicks finally leave, they're already capable flyers. McKay's bunting and rock sandpiper have adapted to their island over millennia. But they face an uncertain future. In spite of St. Matthew's extreme isolation, we're noticing signs of just how much is changing today. The region is in its fourth year of a marine heat wave, and the extent of winter sea ice is at record lows. Warming waters are likely pushing marine prey out of reach for seabirds. And some Arctic colonies have recently seen massive and repeated breeding failures. On the beach near camp, Stephanie has counted nearly 250 carcasses in a 300-meter survey. All signs that worrying trends in seabird productivity and mortality across the Bering Sea may be affecting St. Matthew as well. But for us, it's a small land mammal that represents how quickly change can take hold here. With a warming Arctic, red foxes have swept north across the mainland, outcompeting resident Arctic foxes. They were first spotted here on St. Matthew in 1966. At that time, we would have seen Arctic foxes across the island. But today, in the distance, we glimpse just one, trotting over the tundra. It feels like a ghost of the island's past. St. Matthew is part of a Bering Sea ecosystem that's in rapid flux losing the ice that has defined the existence of its inhabitants for millennia. But for me, this expedition was also a chance to witness firsthand the symptoms of a changing Arctic. There's no telling what future expeditions we'll find here, but it will certainly be different from what we're seeing. Still, we're leaving St. Matthew in awe of what remains. Thank you.